We can mute. It's saying preparing to live stream the meeting. Okay. Exciting. All right, we're All live. Right. Hannah, we can mute. It's saying preparing to live stream the meeting. Okay. Exciting. All right, we're live. Right. You know, we can mute. It's saying preparing to live stream the meeting. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna get started in just a couple minutes. Hey everyone, we're just gonna give it another couple minutes just because we are now on YouTube and I want people to have the chance to come over from Facebook. Hey everyone, we're just gonna give it another couple minutes just because we are now on YouTube and I want people to have the chance to come over from Facebook. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Kaylee Cunningham. I'm the Deputy National Field Director at American Conservation Coalition Campus. Thanks for joining us tonight. I am excited to introduce our guest speaker. So Hannah Downey is the Policy Director at PERC and a ACC Campus Board member. 
Her writing has appeared in Wall Street Journal and The Hill, just to name a few. After being introduced to Perk her freshman year of college, she pursued the ideas of free market environmentalism and became a research assistant as a senior. She graduated from Montana State University with degrees in economics and political science in 2015 and still calls Bozeman home. Take it away, Hannah. Awesome. Thanks, Kaylee. And hey, ACC campus crew, thanks so much for letting me join you this Tuesday evening. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys a little bit about wildlife conservation in America this evening. I think it'll be a really welcome respite from being stuck inside all day. So hopefully we can think outside a little bit and uh, come up with some cool ideas together. So a little bit of background about me. As Kaylee mentioned, I'm Hannah. I'm the policy director at PERC, meaning I work on kind of our environmental policy areas. Um, I grew up with a passion for the outdoors. It's how I got so invested in the ideas of market environmentalism. Uh, that's me. On the right side of your screen and my family, we grew up backpacking in the Beartooth Mountains uh, in southwestern Montana, the most magical place in the entire world, and I might be a little bit biased on that. Uh, but growing up, we just we were outside so much, and it gave me the opportunity through recreation to really realize what the natural world is, and and to realize, you know, not only are there trails to hike or bike or rivers to swim in or fish in, um, but you know, it's the the environment is the air that we breathe. It's the water that we drink. It is where we get the materials for our food and our shelter. And so the, the human relationship with the environment is so essential. And, and there's the fun element of recreation and there's also just the basic human survival element. And so the way that all of those factors interact is so important. And luckily, thanks to that upbringing, I'm still able to do these things that I love today with my family, uh, still in the Beartooth Mountains. If you get a chance to ever go, they're amazing. Um, but that's, that's the root of why I care about um, the things that I do and why I'm so excited to talk with you guys about conservation issues here today. Um, because I really started out, I start from the grounds of conservation is the goal here. And so while I was in college, I, I was a pretty um, free market property rights oriented thinker, uh, but I wanted to go and do environmental law. And the only way that I really saw to do environmental conservation was through government approaches, was through regulation and some of these command and control approaches that I know previous speakers have talked with you guys about over the past few weeks. Um, but luckily, I was in an environmental policy class one day, and a, a woman from, from PERC came and spoke to the class. There was a great representation of different organizations from around Bozeman who work on conservation issues, everything from the Natural Resources Defense Council, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, to this woman from PERC. And she came in and really articulated how, how markets and the environment don't have to be opposed to each other. Instead, they can work together to find these really collaborative, innovative and lasting approaches to environmental conservation. So uh, kind of as Kaylee mentioned, that was how I got introduced to PERC while I was in school and uh, went to the organization and asked them to take me on as a research assistant. And so a few years later, here I am leading up our policy work. Um, so a little bit about PERC. This is a view from our deck. It's gorgeous. Unfortunately, there is still snow in Montana. So if you want to send some spring our way, please be my guest. Um, but I think this view just showcases, again, why we do what we do and how easy it is to be inspired about um, environmental conservation. Uh, so PERC is a research organization. We've been around for 40 years in Montana. We grew out of Montana State University because there were some economics professors who were great outdoorsmen and they asked the question if, if markets and economics can provide us with bread or cell phones or all of these other things that we want why can't markets produce environmental quality? Or, or, or maybe they can, and it's just something we haven't looked at before. So PERP came around um, 40 years ago and research remains our focus. We are dedicated to natural resource conservation, looking at how market principles can, can promote 
uh, environmental outcomes around the world. We have a focus, we are based in Bozeman, Montana, as I've mentioned, uh, but we do have research fellows all around the world working on everything from elk migration in Yellowstone to uh, elephant conservation in Africa, water markets, energy uh, innovations, things like that. And, and we've been really lucky to work with some incredible minds. And we're, And my job there is to really take that research and say, here are the ideas that we think will promote innovation and, and conservation. What are the policy barriers there? Sometimes it requires removing regulations. Sometimes it's encouraging the government to reduce a command and control approach and move more towards a market oriented approach because ultimately um, in the status quo government does own a lot of our resources or manage our resources. So, so that's where my role comes in there. We do a bunch of programs. Um, in addition to our in-house research team, every summer we bring in students, research fellows, academics, conservation experts, writers, um, all interested in kind of joining us in the quest to explore how can property rights and trade better enhance conservation outcomes. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how exactly free market environmentalism applies to wildlife conservation. But in order to get into that, we first have to understand what is free market environmentalism. It's a kind of a buzzword or phrase that I've been throwing around a lot in the past few minutes, but I think it's important we take some time to dive into what exactly that means. So that when we dive into the, the wildlife elements, we're able to make some of those connections. Uh, so basically free market environmentalism at its core is how voluntary trade and deregulated trade can produce good environmental outcomes. Ultimately, conservation is a question of how do we allocate our resources um, and property rights in, in Perk's mind are the answers. For example, um, let's take let's take beautiful Yellowstone National Park, for example. There's lots of competing demands there. There's people who want it for recreation. There's people who want it just for amenity values to know that it exists. There's people who want it for wildlife uses. There's also people who would say, why don't we develop this? Why don't we put in hotels? There's others who would say, why don't we we mine? Why don't there's um, there's potential for gold mining in, in the Yellowstone area? Why don't we do some of these things? So it's co questions and competition over how do we use those resources? And how do we allocate those resources? And we come to property rights as the answer for that. So property rights, usually you think of like, my property is my house, or it's this, this plot of land that I own. And I'm here to kind of expand how we think about that from a more economic space perspective. So property right is basically just that you own something. It could be land, it could be, um, it, uh, wildlife, it could be all of these different things. But here are a few, a few traits that are necessary to actually have a secure property right. And these different traits are gonna be discussed as we, we go through some of these wildlife examples. So the first is that a property right is definable. You know what it is, you know the boundaries, you can say, you know, this is my backyard, or you can say, this is my, um, this is my dog, <laughs> this is my pencil, whatever it is, you're able to define those limits. Defendable also means that you're able to, to enforce those and you're able to say, this is mine and I am able to, in the general population, de defend that this is mine. Um, usually we think of that through like police powers or court enforcement, things like that. Also that something's excludable, meaning uh, it's, it's not commonly shared. People can't just come in and use it or take it from you. Additionally, um, appropriable or tradable, meaning you have the right to decide, do I wanna use this for myself or do I want to trade this with someone else for a mutually beneficial exchange? And finally, um, liable. So if I have a dog and my dog goes and bites someone, am I liable for that? Or if someone has a beautiful backyard and I take my garbage and just throw it in their flower beds, I'm liable for that damage. And that's gonna come up a lot in the case of wildlife. The, liable, the liability angle is something uh, that's lacking in a lot of, lot of management structures. So we kind of refer to this as the, the deal of property rights, uh, the double D deal, just something to consider as we move forward. So ultimately, how do these, these tools and these tenets of property rights promote conservation? First is the element that, of ownership. 
we care about the things that we own. Uh, you always hear people don't wash rental cars, but they'll wash their own cars. And that's because that you know that what you put into something and the care that you put into something, you receive back uh, or you're able to reap those benefits. Um, liability, as I've kind of touched on, we're responsible for damages done to others. It is it encourages us to consider what we do with our waste or how, how we harm others. And finally, trade so that we value competing demands and can reallocate resources. If I have a stretch of river that I use to pull water out of to irrigate my fields, but someone else says, hey, you know, you pulling water out of that river for your fields leaves less water in stream for trout, and I really want there to be trout um, habitat there, then we can exchange and I can trade my water right with them for money or however we agree on some form of compensation so that that water is allocated best between, between those users rather than um, someone just taking it or, or punishing me somehow for it. So um, those are a few of the things that I want us to just keep in mind as we delve into what wildlife conservation looks like from a free market perspective. So let's go back to the beginning of what a world without property rights might look like. And those of you who have studied economics or are interested in the topic might know this as a tragedy of the commons. What happens if nobody owns a resource and it's just free for the taking? So the example we're gonna look at today is with bison in the American West. It's the, the national mammal. It's an incredible species that we're so lucky to have. Um, but back in the 1700s before the West was settled, there were millions of bison. It's estimated that up to 10 million bison roamed um, the plains and, and the herds were prevalent and some of the Native Americans hunted them. But for the most part, the bison just had free reign, um, not too many predators and, and they were absolutely abundant. It was incredible. Uh, but as, as the West began to be settled and cowboys moved in and we realized that some of their strange land had great value for cattle and settlement and great American expansion and all of those, those ideas that were pushed in the 1800s, we saw, the, again, this competing use over the plains. Is it left natural or are we, are we using it for cattle? Are we using it for settlement, for railroads, all of those types of issues? And as it happened, and as things moved in, we saw an immense decline in bison population. So here in this map, you can see some of the traditional range um, and in the darker blue herd sizes and then getting into the lighter blue and even the brown of how those numbers shrank um, over just, just a few decades. So you can see that in 1870, it was estimated that there were about 10 million bison by the, night, by the 1880s, excuse me, so just about a decade later, fewer than a thousand bison were left. It was terrible. We had immense just decimation of, of the bison population. So how did this happen? I think this picture shows that humans definitely played a role in it. There were a lot of factors, some climate, some, um, some more natural factors, but ultimately it was the presence of humans and again that competing demands over how rangeland was used that led to this scenario where we had literally millions of bison kills um, just in a few short years. So there's two potential explanations and I think they actually go together. So the first is the, the tragedy of the commons approach that, that I briefly touched on, the idea that no one owned the bison when they moved in. Sure, some Native American tribes kind of had traditional hunting rights to it, but um, as American settlers moved in and disregarded those rights, it essentially became there were no rights to the bison, which led subsequently to a mass harvest, especially with bison hides fetching about $3 um, per hide, which was a, a pretty high price we saw range riders going out and just decimating the bison population, leading to pictures like this, where skulls are bleached, hides are shipped off back east to be used for leather goods. Um, and additionally, settlers ate them. There was no reason to think about sustainable harvest here because what you didn't go out and hunt and take, the next person would do. And so no concept of sustainability whatsoever. Just, just I have to go out and get mine or else someone else is gonna take it first. So there's another idea out there um, that's, that's discussed about bison, about 
ultimately saying that cattle were more valuable on the range. There was no reason to stop the sla slaughter of bison um, because we wanted cattle there. Why would we establish property rights to something that was, was worthless? Which again, I think assumes the worthlessness of, of bison, um, which, which, is, which has some validity because bison were exceptionally difficult to domesticate and herd um, and all of those things. So cattle were certainly more easier to handle and easier to use on the landscape. Um, but again, there was, there was no concept of liability. There was no sense of if someone valued the bison, whether for existence value or, or food, or even wanting to cultivate a herd so that they could sustainably um, harvest bison hides and continue to collect that profit, there was none of that. And so it was essentially this free for all tragedy of the commons where we end up with this. Um, and so no matter, again, no matter which option you think is correct, and I'd argue it's a bit of a mix, the incentives for conservation were ultimately wrong. There were no property rights. There was no liability. There was no reason to look to the future for the bison. Um, it was about maximizing current opportunities to get what you could get now rather than, than thinking long-term. Which leads, I think, to the question, why don't we just have government regulate it? Why don't we, if we think this is important as conservationists, why don't we just come in and say, well, regulate it, stop this, this is bad. We, we, want, we want wildlife to be here. We don't just want it to be cowboys and cattle and, and development nowadays. So can, can't we just force landowners to provide some of this wildlife habitat? And that's a lot of what we've seen uh, historically through, through government approaches to wildlife management. And again, it's important to note in a lot of this that wildlife as a whole, non-endangered species are managed by state fish and wildlife agencies. Endangered species are managed by US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, of course, there's always some intricacies with all of this, um, but it's also important to note that the species are managed and not fully owned by each of these government entities. But so what we did, because we think species existence is really important, we went around and created the Endangered Species Act. And this is an act that basically bans doing harm to, to endangered species. It's a, it takes a very command and control and regulatory approach to say, um, you know, this species, the, the population is low. It's either considered an endangered or a threatened species and it's put on a list and species on that list are protected. You can't harm them. And that harm includes harming their habitat. Um, which, which of course is all well-intentioned and the rhetoric is incredible, um, but where do, where do the incentives lead here? What, what does a regulatory approach, approach do here? And so what we've seen with the Endangered Species Act, sure there have been some incredible instances of wildlife recovery, but honestly less than 3% of the species that have been put on the list um, have actually recovered. And, and I, we have to look at where do the incentives lead? Ultimately, we're gonna get the results that the incentives set up. So here we have um, landowners who provide very valuable habitat that is crucial for the existence and recovery of endangered species. But those landowners are being told, actually, you know, you, you have this timber stand, which provides incredible habitat for a red cockaded woodpecker. You rely on that timber harvest to make a living. But actually, because it's potentially woodpecker habitat, you can't cut down those trees and harvest and sell them. They're, they're, it's led to an approach known widely as shoot, shovel, and shut up, where you don't want anyone to know that the species is on your property because you might get regulated. And so as a result, you're harming the species um, and you aren't willing to really engage here. Again, this incentives don't align to promote active conservation and habitat preservation on property. Um, this example of some of the pictures here of the red cockaded woodpecker and some, some perk researchers and affiliates actually did a study looking at um, the incentives for habitat conservation for this endangered bird as a result of the Endangered Species Act. And what these researchers found was that the, the woodpecker preferred these older growth trees. Um, and so when landowners were told you know, you can't, you can't cut down those trees. You have, once it becomes old growth, you can't harm it. That's essential for the woodpecker. Well, what the landowners that started doing instead was they would cut down the trees before they had the chance to become woodpecker habitat. 
So here we're harming everyone. The landowner is saying, hey, I might not get as much money as if this were an old growth tree, but if I harvest it right now, I can at least make some money off of it because I can at least harvest it. And if I harvest it while it's young, it won't attract the woodpeckers. If I don't let it grow old, it can't become habitat. So I can't become liable or I can't have the species be a liability to my livelihood and my, my operation here. And so in a way, the, the incentives, well, well-intentioned were, were perverse in that they led to the exact opposite of outcome. They led to habitat destruction rather than habitat conservation. So clearly there's been some room for, there is room for improvement. And Perk's done some work in the past years um, looking at how do we reduce that liability? How do we keep species from being a liability to the very people they depend on and the habitat they depend on for their survival? So one of the recent things we've been looking at um, was a recent change within the Department of the Interior and how endangered species are managed that actually creates a distinction between endangered and threatened species. So those are our two different uh, segments on the endangered species list. Endangered means you're like very, very, very at risk of going extinct. Threatened means you're kind of on the verge. And so what we've we've looked at and have supported is, is the distinction between those two in a regulatory framework. Previously, they were treated the same um, under regulation, meaning the same take and harm prohibitions were applied to both groups. Um, what's happening now is that we're able to see threatened species have some of those take prohibitions restricted. And so it sort of serves as a signal where you have an incentive as a, as a landowner to say, I have this endangered species, and I know that if I help promote recovery to a point where it's no longer endangered, but is instead threatened, some of the regulations are lifted on me. So that promotes the incentive to actually work towards conservation and towards species recovery. On the other hand, if you have a threatened species, suddenly there's a fear of that if you let that population drop too much, uh, that's when you're gonna then see more of those regulatory uh, punishment approaches. And so by having that sort of tiered approach, you have incentives to move up and a fear of moving down. So you're able to better engage. Again, this ultimately depends um, on, on species still being a liability. We're able to relieve some of that liability and some of that regulatory pain, but we aren't able to yet make species a full asset, which is what we want. We want landowners to say, if I have this species and if I conserve this habitat, I'm able to benefit here. And again, I keep coming back to the engagement between human landowners and these species because endangered species, 80% depend um, on private lands for some of their well-being. And it's these private lands and these largely um, open agricultural lands that do provide so much of this valuable habitat. But again, agricultural lands um, rely on some of this harvest to make their livelihood. So how do we get those two things to work in tandem and to be working towards similar goals rather than be fighting against each other? So there's definitely still room to grow there, but we've seen some really cool, cool movement um, in positive directions there and towards aligning those incentives for conservation recently. Which brings me back to the return of the bison. How do we actually make species an asset rather than a liability? Uh, so the interesting story for what back when we were in the late 1800s down to just a thousand bison, a few entrepreneurial um, kind of market oriented cowboys said, you know, these, these bison might be worth something. They were seeing that, um, that there was suddenly an interest in this in this species and that folks like even the great conservationist Teddy Roosevelt wanted to come hunt a bison because he said there might not be any left um, in the near future. The Smithsonian, for example, was authorizing kind of sample collection groups to come out and get bison because they were afraid of it going extinct. And so suddenly there is an interest that, you know, the bison, sure, it might not be worth as much um, in mass quantities on the plains as cattle at this moment. But what about the future? What about future potential and, and an interest in this species? So praise goodness, um, private individuals stepped in and were able to save a few bison and kind of create their own private herds. And these, these private 
bison, um, again, the property rights where they were able to define what they owned, they were able to claim ownership over the herd, and, and in effect, start to treat bison similar to livestock and cattle and have some of the same ideas of ownership and responsibility that apply to cattle, apply to bison. And they were able to cultivate uh, their herds and, and spread around those herds. And so today, one of the most interesting examples of this that we see is Mr. Ted Turner, um, who owns vast ranch properties around the West and has been a huge player in the return of the bison to the American West. So Mr. Turner had bison and, and part of his lure for having these bison in addition to just being a conservationist himself was that he knew in order to pay for the land and the space and um, you know, all, all the things that go into running a bison operation, he, need, he needs, there needs to be some income from that. And luckily, going back to that idea of tradability um, of a property right, he was able to maximize on bison markets and he runs Ted's Montana Grills and they've taken off and you can go in and get a bison burger. Um, and that funding is then able to go back into bison conservation. Through that, one of, the, one of the key elements here is that Yellowstone National Park um, was home to one of the last, last kind of natural wild free roaming bison herds. And they had to go through a period of quarantine for, for diseases and such. And, and Ted Turner said, you know, you, you need a space to quarantine these bison for five years. I, I, I can provide that space on my ranches. Um, and in return, I get a share of all of the bison calves that are born while this bison herd is in quarantine. And so through that, uh, Ted Turner was able to kind of build his own herd of bison that have this kind of purely genetic Yellowstone lineage in them, which is, which is rare. And, and he's been able to grow his populations like tenfold, I'd say, I believe it's that he has 45,000 bison right now, which represents about 20% of the nation's total bison population. And so through this and through these um, market approaches where you're able to establish clear property rights and ownership over, um, over a resource and you're able to look towards sustainable harvest and trade and able to actually turn um, what was once a liability or was once deemed worthless on the American plains, turn that into an asset that's worth cultivating, that's worth sustaining and worth investing in. And it's interesting to see that now, um, you know, the returns that we've been able to see due to these private enterprises, not command and control approaches, not government regulation, but instead private entrepreneurs who saw an opportunity to maximize on a resource and to continue to cultivate and conserve that resource, we've come back from the brink, from only having a thousand bison to now um, pushing, I think we have close to 250,000 bison now in the United States. Again, a, a lot of those are private, um, but we have them. We're back from the brink and we're able to then re release bison into state parks and on tribal reservations and, sp and spread this, this incredible animal that was um, once thought gone from the plains has come back. And again, this, it's complicated. It does raise some interesting moral issues, um, such as the idea of treating treating wild, at what point is something wildlife, at what point is it livestock, what's the relationship between the two. But through it all, we have to ask, compared to what? And what are the results? Um, compared to extinction of this incredible native species, I'd say it's a no brainer. I'd rather, I'd rather, have these populations and have them go extinct. Um, and looking at being able to compare the return of the bison to the 99% of species that are still stuck on the endangered species list, I, I think it becomes really clear that incentives matter in wildlife conservation. And humans play a role in that. And the more that we are able to actively engage humans and have the people that live so close to this wildlife um, be actively involved in their recovery because the wildlife is an asset rather than a liability. That's where we're able to get the long-term long lasting successes.
so I know I kind of ran through a bunch there and I look forward to greater discussion and talking about different species, different approaches, how the incentives align and why incentives matter more. Um, but it all comes down to kind of these few takeaways that I feel like I've repeated time and time again, so I'm, I apologize for any repetition. But these good approaches to conservation get the incentives right. They respect property rights. They acknowledge competing demands. They address the concerns of liability. Um, exchange is voluntary rather than forced coercion. And we're focused on making wildlife an asset. Uh, so if you have any questions on any of these ideas or or kind of conclusions, I'd love to discuss more. Um, so yeah, Akili, if you want to run through any questions, I'm happy to take any you might have. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, we have quite a few questions. So um, as you know, this was a live stream. So questions are coming in as you were talking. So I'm going to read them all off just to make sure no one gets skipped over. And you can totally be like, I covered that or sure, I'll expand it, you know. Yeah. However you feel. So let's go back to the beginning. Is it possible to use the concept of property rights to solve larger issues like climate change? If not, what should we prioritize? That's a great question. And especially with some of the more global issues, I'm thinking um, like climate change, ocean plastics, those are really difficult. And I think that's where market approaches are going to be so important. We're going to need um, definitely collaboration at a global scale and buy-in at global scales. But we're, if we're able to find the ideas that work at local scales and that, um, you know, again, make conservation and carbon reduction, plastic pollution reduction, if we're able to find ways to make those things worth it, um, that's where we're able to see the lasting approaches. And I know uh, ACC, the American Conservation Coalition, and your group, Kaylee, you guys are leading on the American climate contract, and that's going to be huge. Those ideas where we're able to say, like, yes, we agree, this is a huge problem that we need to think about, but that we're going to commit to using innovative approaches. We're going to commit uh, to harnessing the power of entrepreneurs. We're going to use common sense solutions here. That's how we're going to be able to see the lasting results rather than just saying, how do we shut things down? How do we go back? We have to look forward and frameworks that allow local flexibility and solutions that work better at a local level, be that um, you know, individual households, individual regions of the United States, different countries, um, being able to have that flexibility locally while working towards a shared common goal is gonna be important. Awesome, cool. thank you so much. Uh, the next question from our viewers is, what are your thoughts on the Endangered Species Act, which I know you touched on kind of the policies behind it? Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll just expand or reiterate a little bit. Again, Endangered Species Act, the, the intention there is so good. We do need to to preserve our species and be conscious of, of what um, extinction means in our ecosystems and for biodiversity and the signals that the loss of species um, mean for environmental health as a whole, which is subsequently then human health. Um, however, we do have to look at results rather than just rhetoric. Uh, Endangered Species Act has a lot of room to improve and some of those approaches I touched on where we can uh, reduce liability and eventually even move more towards species conservation as an asset. That's gonna be essential to making sure uh, we don't just kind of put species in this emergency room and never get them recovered. We're able to say, okay, you need help, get in here. How do we get you back to, to sustainable levels? So, uh... What does a successful public and private partnership look like? Do you have any real life examples? Yeah, um, I mean, ultimately on this stuff, public private partnerships are gonna be key because of government's role in wildlife management. Um, one example that I'm thinking off, off, of off the top of my head, um, kind of in my backyard with Yellowstone, are the ideas of um, endangered predators and what does that mean for humans on the landscape? For example, 
uh, when we had the, the gray wolf reintroduced in Yellowstone, we've seen some incredible success there, but there was a ton of animosity uh, with, with the ranchers who owned so many of the open landscapes that these wolves were reliant on for their habitat. And ranchers were so concerned because they were saying, hey, these wolves are coming in and they're killing my cattle. And ultimately, it's, ultimately again, it's that question of resource allocation. Who has the right to be on that range, cattle or wolves? And there's a ton, a ton of animosity about that and a ton of discussion over, over what should be right. But the sort of market-based approach that was so incredible there uh, was for wolf advocates and actually defenders of wildlife was able to come in and create a wolf compensation program where they said, we understand that these wolves are a liability to you. And what you care about is that you are losing your livelihood every time a wolf kills your cow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compensate you. Uh, we're gonna help make you whole um, for, for that change and for that loss of livestock. And so here we saw um, you know, a private group coming in, ultimately yet yeah, having to work um, as it progressed because of some of the restrictions on the wolves and just the wolves endangered status working on some of those things. And we've seen a lot of governments actually ultimately adopting those ideas that came about in a really private marketplace oriented approach and saying that works. Rather than telling people don't shoot wolves, we're able to say, hey, let's take this market approach and apply it to our approach. So those are the sorts of government public private partnerships and knowledge learning that we have to do and say, how can government use more of those market approaches? Awesome. I love it. I love the at home example. Um, so that kind of, oh, I do want to mention to everyone watching, we, Hannah and I are a little bit, a couple minutes ahead of everyone. So if you have a question, please don't hesitate to ask it because we don't want to log off and you think we're still going. Uh, <laughs> but so your, what you just talked about definitely leads into the next question I have is what role do you see the federal government playing in conservation? That, that's a great question as a market environmentalist. Um, ultimately, I think that the more we can move away from, from government, the better. Um, or at least I should clarify, the, le the more we can move away from command and control approaches backed by government power, the better. Um, and so, but we have to start where we are right now, which is that there's tons of government involvement. Look at all of our public lands, which I love. They're why I'm in Montana. Um, the opportunity to get outside and recreate in these public spaces, they are owned by the federal government or state governments. Um, and so we have to start there. Wildlife managed by, again, government entities. And so the key in all of this is to move that needle and say where we used to rely on command and control approaches backed by government power and regulations, how does government now find their role to be we're upholding those property rights. We're, in, uh, we're supporting those property rights. In course of law, we're able to enforce um, those property rights. Going back to those, those tenants I talked about, the, the deal of property rights, how can government work to better support those and cultivate those ideas um, rather than just take command and control? So there's tons, there's tons of ways for that to play out. And again, it's gonna be a lot of moving the needle, um, but we have to start where we are and there's some really great things that are being done and there's some ways that government can engage effectively on a lot of those things. So again, learning from markets, learning from private enterprise, finding those partnerships and moving the needle. So next question, do you think tourism in parks has a negative effect on wildlife? That is a great question, um, and I will I will straight up say I am not a biologist or an ecologist, so I cannot vouch specifically to any of those science questions. Um, in my understanding of reading the literature on those things, humans do make an impact. Um, you know, our presence can disrupt. Uh, mating areas we can when you feed bears in the parks that cultivates terrible terrible like dependency approaches uh so yeah there is there is an impact that humans have on our natural world it's the finding the ways to to mitigate that and again be innovative in a lot of those approaches um some really cool ideas are 
being able to identify, you know, maybe where where are animals giving birth and raising their young? So then we're able to maybe as recreationists direct our activities elsewhere. Um, even just tools like bear bells, love them or hate them, you know, most, at least in our neck of the woods, most bear conflicts with humans come from surprise interactions. So if we're able to like be conscious of habits and, um, and recreate responsibly, leave no trace, be aware of where you're going, be conscious of seasons and timing and don't un be unnecessarily disruptive. Um, I think there's a lot we can do there to help at least reduce or mitigate the impacts. Right, because right. we're a part of it. We got to get along. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so what do you, what, what do we do, sorry, what do we do about invasive species and noxious weeds? Oh, that is a great question. And I can say I have not looked into or researched much of that stuff. Um, so I'm gonna probably tell you for, for a really good answer, you might wanna go elsewhere. Uh, however, one example I have worked on that is, is interesting is the case of the lionfish in Florida. Uh, the, the lionfish is this invasive species, they're poisonous, they come into um, like warmer tropical waters and kind of decimate reefs. And so some of the cool ideas that are being taken in Florida are, are innovative ideas and entrepreneurial approaches where they're holding lionfish derbies. Um, groups are working to, to research and identify how do we better capture this invasive species. Um, again, this is not my area of expertise, but it's one where we really have to say, ultimately, I don't think saying like, Oh, we don't want lionfish here is going to get rid of it. So it's instead, how do we, how do we learn from other sectors? How do we um, work with humans? How do we learn from private enterprise and innovate so that we can address those problems? Thanks. Awesome. Um, so you you kind of you explained this, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about when it comes to the Yellowstone wolf situation? Um, I think mostly. I, I discussed a little bit the wolf compensation program that was so successful here. Um, again, as with all wildlife and natural things, things get complicated. People are very heated in their views of it. Um, but the value in that approach and why, I mean, Montana is one of the places where our wolf populations have recovered to a point um, where our wolves are off the endangered species list. And again, that was through kind of some complicated political measures, but uh, being able to find those collaborative approaches where we're able to say, we want wolf habitat, you can provide wolf habitat, how do we make this worth it for everyone? Those are the sort of approaches we got to continue pursuing, especially as um, a lot of the, the rest of the West and a lot of the rest of the United States also considers how do they want to handle um, growing predator populations. Would you say most species recovery has come from private entities? You know, that's, that's a good question and one that I don't know if I can provide an answer for. Um, some of the species, the really charismatic ones that we have seen recoveries for, for example, the bald eagle and that recovery, that did ultimately come from regulatory approaches and banning some sorts of, of pesticides and chemicals there. Um, so I think as Todd Myers kind of touched on on last, last week's conversation, there were definitely like some big buckets that government actions were able to swoop in and scoop up and remove that problem. Uh, I think some of the endangered species situations were similar to that. However, it's also important to look at and say, you know, that was 3% of the species and, and our regulations haven't really moved the needle past that. What other approaches can we use now? Right, kind of hit a dead end a, a little bit. Gotcha. So uh, do you think that the court system plays a role in wildlife conservation? That's a great question. Um, I would direct folks who, who are most interested in that, go check out Jonathan Wood. He's a Perk Research Fellow and a lawyer uh, with the Pacific Legal Foundation. He is one of the most brilliant legal minds on how the legal system works with wildlife conservation. Uh, so he's far more of an expert on that than I could be. Um, however, 
we've turned, we're, we're very litigious in how we're addressing wildlife problems. For example, right now, the grizzly bear in Montana is stuck in a court case over whether it should be uh, delisted or not. And so ultimately we are seeing issues surrounding wildlife getting more and more into the courts. And I think that's something we need to pay attention to. Ultimately, one of the ways that I would love to see this um, play out, and again, this might be hundreds of years down the road and a great thought process shift in how we approach wildlife conservation, um, but would be those courts really helping to enforce those property rights and helping to negotiate contracts and trade amongst people. Um, but yeah, check out Jonathan Wood's work. He's far more of an expert on this than I am. Nice, nice. I took an environmental law class and all I remember was that sea turtle eggs won their case. So I know there's a precedent for sea turtle eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's tons of opportunity there. And um, legally, ultimately, the environment can kind of get used as a pawn in some of the legal and environmental issues. Uh, so again, making sure that we're conscious of those actual results rather than just moving those political pawns and rhetoric is going to be important. Right, right. So next question, is it fair to say that free markets slash capital capitalism both was the cause but now is the most practical solution of the nation's environmental problems? Is, is there a property environment paradox? Oh, that's a big question. Um, yeah. <laughs> definitely a big question. I mean, I don't think anyone, this might be more general than whoever asked the question was hoping for me to get in this. So again, I'm more than happy. I think I shared my email and Twitter information and whatnot. So please feel free to reach out to me um, if, I, if I don't answer your question or if you have more specific instances that you'd like some thoughts on. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there is definitely a role to say that like production and things have led to pollution and environmental problems um, in the United States. It is also worth noting on some of that, that a lot of that is a result of lack of property rights or lack of clear property rights. For example, if you go back, again, bringing, bringing in uh, the courts and legal issues here, um, there have been cases about where property rights are clear, where we've been able to uh, prevent pollution. And this goes back quite a ways um, with some of the Clean Water Act stuff um, of you know instances where factories were polluting or whatever. But because people downstream were able to have a clear enough property right to have healthy water sources, they were able to stop that pollution. Again, that liability component was huge there. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say it's it's, there are elements of it that have been part of the problem. Um, usually when we have those problems, it's worth going back and asking, were those property rights clear? Were those property rights strong and able to be legally enforced in those instances? Um, looking forward, however, I think there's capitalism is gonna be crucial in solving so many of our problems. Innovation is gonna be essential. Look at the ways we've come to become more efficient with our resource uses. Um, Look at the tools and, and the science that we've been able to accomplish due to innovation that, that's profit motivated. And it's, again, these, these moral questions are kind of hard, but I, I have to come back to asking compared to what? And if, someone, if someone's only doing something or someone's only innovating our, our cars or our airlines or whatever it is so that we, they can make more profit by using fewer inputs and that then that subsequently is good for the environment i'm going to go ahead and say that's a win for the environment um we got a profit motive is not a bad thing when it comes to conservation so looking forward there's huge potential for innovation and capitalism and entrepreneurs to step in and help solve the problems and that is only possible if we have clear property rights Great, thank you. Uh, so it looks like someone left for a minute and then popped back in and they were wondering if they had missed the name for the group of cowboys who helped with the bison. Oh, that's a great question. So there were a few different groups um, and different instances of, of cowboys um, doing this. Ted Turner is the, the example that I was using in Montana. 
um, where he was able to kind of refer, restore some of the Yellowstone bison lineage and grow that population. Um, however, going back to like the 1800s when, when population, bison populations were down to just the thousands, um, Charles Goodnight and Frederick Dupree were two cowboys who are credited with a lot of this, um, with being able to pull, pull some individual bison and build their own stock herds. Um, but yeah, there were, there were a few instances there, but definitely uh, the number of entrepreneurial cowboys compared to the number of bison hunters was not a good ratio. Gotcha. <laughs> So, um, can you speak to the loss of the wild herd gene in bison due to domestication? Ecologists, I hear, are fearing the over-domestication of the species. How might the market worsen or help this issue? Ooh, that's, that's a great question. And again, I'm going to preface this by saying, unfortunately, I'm not an ecologist and not a bison ecologist. So I'm sorry if I'm going to tiptoe around this question and not totally answer that. Um, but I, I agree that I, I, I think that's an issue. And um, from my knowledge, that's, that was one of the big valuable contributions that Ted Turner was able to contribute by helping to provide a quarantine and um, continue the lineage of the, of the pure Yellowstone bison. I mean, even even just in, in Bozeman, it's incredible the number of new bison ranches that are popping up. It's kind of become this like trendy environmentalist thing where um, natural resource defense lawyers are now becoming bison ranchers and it's, it's incredible. Um, but yes, completely agree that that does ask the question of livestock versus wildlife and, and what's that line. Um, and I think we still have to revert back to asking ourselves compared to what. Um, I'd agree that if there's a demand for kind of these genetically pure bison, that that's something that the market's able to react to, kind of how Ted Turner was able to do it. Again, there's restrictions there, there's hurdles that have to be overcome. Um, and I unfortunately can't speak to the details there, but uh, we got to ask compared to what, and if there's demand for it, there's, we should be able to find ways to, to provide it. So this is, this is a big one. I definitely don't know anything about this. So <laughs> hopefully you have some insight here. Do you have any thoughts on how the new focus on the Chinese wet markets could impact wildlife trading and or smuggling on an international level? And how could that impact conservation here in the United States? Oh, great question. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. Uh, Wildlife trade is, is a difficult subject and morally it's a difficult subject. Uh, however, I'm going to go ahead and say that legal monitored trade is very different than like illegal black market trade. Um, and so unfortunately I'm not an expert in some of these wet market areas, um, but we're seeing, especially with some of the international and more exotic species um, that ultimately, if it pays, it stays. And again, that ownership of if you're able to um, allow ownership of species and then allow those to be traded in, in managed markets that, um, that does provide valuable funding for conservation. I direct you to some of Catherine Semser's work. Uh, she's a research fellow at PERP. She does a lot on international wildlife and international wildlife trade um, just to, further explain how that works and why that's a benefit. Um, but would definitely agree there's concern over black market uses and what happens when wildlife aren't owned, but there's a value for it. Going back to that bison example of if someone's willing to pay for something to be dead and no one owns it to be able to stop someone else from killing it. Uh, we see wildlife populations harmed. Uh, we see instances of human health concerns and things like that. Um, but yeah, I direct you to some of Catherine Semser's work for more details on that. Awesome, thank you. Um, could you actually maybe kind of talk about some of the international like conservation works like the safaris in particular? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question um, and definitely a hot topic. We aren't straying away from any of the hard moral questions uh, today. But um, it, one of the instances, I'll, I'll keep it a little lighter. One of the instances I've been looking at recently is how do markets turn uh, poachers into wildlife protectors? Um, for example, looking at some of the conservancies in Africa and specifically Kutata 11 in Mozambique, um, a, a, a conservationist and a, a professional hunting guide there was able to kind of take private management and ownership of this Kutata and reintroduce a lot of wildlife that had previously been decimated due to civil war in the region. And so what he was able to do um, was he knew there was a huge poaching problem. And it's important to note that poaching is both poaching of wildlife for animal parts trade, such as elephant ivory or tiger bone wine, those sorts of things. Um, but there's also poaching in the sense of just illegal hunting, um, which especially in war, pre formerly war-torn areas where food shortages are great, people are, are illegally hunting to feed their families. And so um, in, in Kutata 11, this, this hunter knew that poaching was a rampant problem. And the best way that he was gonna be able to stop poaching was to actually rely on some of the expertise of the poachers for how this was done and how to best protect the wildlife. So what he was able to do was actually hire these former poachers to become wildlife protectors. And it through this, through a steady paycheck, um, poachers knowing that they were able, for poachers, it was never about like, oh, I hate, uh, you know, I, I want to destroy all of this wildlife. It was that like, this is what I have to do to survive and to, or to make money. And now suddenly when you have a legal approach to still feed your families and bring home a paycheck um, that actually involves wildlife protection, that's where the Katata now gets its, its anti-poaching force. And they've had incredible success. And there's instances of this happening uh, with sea turtles in Nicaragua or tigers in India. And these approaches are being taken where it's not so much, OK, poaching is already banned. We've tried the regulatory approach here. Um, but instead, if we're able to operate in a market and provide a positive incentive for people to be protectors rather than poachers, there's been incredible responses there and poaching numbers in those areas have declined dramatically. Um, so things like that where making wildlife an asset, making it pay, in some instances that might be through uh, hunting operations or safari tourism operations. But if, if, again, the reliance on sustainability there is so important, but when you're able to switch up those incentives so that wildlife is an asset and a benefit to the local people who live with it and are able to protect it, there have been incredible results. Great. All right. Last call people out there for questions, because this is the last one I have so far to ask Hannah. So um, what do you think is the best way for individuals like you and I to advocate for this approach to conservation? That's a great question. Um, I think we got to keep it solution oriented. It's really the, the thing that's important to note with a lot of this approach, um, and especially with some of the regulatory approaches, is it's all well intentioned. We share a common goal of conserving wildlife, of improving human lives, of, of all of these things, of the balance of nature in a lot of these things. We share those goals. The importance comes to what are the actual results there. And so I'd encourage us to not just think about how do we say, oh, well, like the Endangered Species Act is bad or like this approach, government doing this is bad. We have to instead provide an alternative solution. Um, and a lot of that is going to have to be pretty, if we're looking for an a way to solve wolves, we're gonna have to understand the, the situation facing wolves and work with the local incentives and the local knowledge there. But as a whole, ultimately, it's just gonna be providing these ideas of market environmentalism, sharing why incentives work, offering this up as a solution um, to a shared, a shared concern over a problem. Well, cool. thank you. Well, um, it doesn't look like anyone has any more. So um, do you have any closing statements, final thoughts for everyone? 
No, thank you guys so much for having me. It was awesome to get to talk to you about um, all of this and market environmentalism and what it means for wildlife conservation. So uh, I think you have my contact info. So please feel free to reach out with any other questions, thoughts, or concerns. And I'd love to continue the conversation. And thanks awesome. so much, Kaylee and ACC, for having me. Yes, thank you, Hannah. Thanks for always advising us and being on our board now. Um, that, that's all. Thanks for watching, everyone. Awesome.